Hi, everyone. This is Raghu Marcus, and welcome to another episode from Ramdas Here and Now. We picked an excerpt from March 1976 in Santa Cruz. Ramdas actually was giving a four day retreat, and I found something from that, uh, from those talks that just ha- it was chock full of different. Uh, not anything terribly new, one would say. And people ask me, well, you do, you know, all of these uh, podcasts using lectures, you know, from the media library. How do you manage to keep it uh, fresh? And it's Ramdas who manages to keep it fresh, who has done that throughout his teaching career. And uh, in this case, the way that he said some of the things that he said I found uh, was very unique, and he always manages to come up with stuff that is just has a different bit of a twist on it to make it uh, to make you wake up a little bit more uh, than you might have even if you had heard that same thing or the same theme rather that uh, you might have heard fifty episodes ago. So in this talk and. You know, I I do love to highlight uh, some of the things that are that are in these talks because I'm hoping they give everyone a time to really reflect on on those particular um, insights that Ramdas comes up with that, that I think are pretty important. Uh, the first one here is uh, the need for a sense of humor about your own predicament. He talks about that, and in fact, uh, we were just. Uh, recently did a retreat. We do these wonderful retreats now. I don't know if I've talked about this before. In Ojai, California, at Hanuman Gardens. And this is something Ramdas asked us to put together. And they're more of an immersion of his teachings where we really focus uh, on uh, different themes each day using some of the media, much like I'm doing here, actually, uh, for Ramdas Here and Now. Uh, and but we do it with Dharma teachers. We did this with Mirabai Star, a wonderful teacher, and uh, uh, it uh, it came up because there was a Q and A, and somebody said, "What do you think the role of humor is on the spiritual path? What uh, where where would you place it in the hierarchy of importance?" And he said, "Number one, without a sense of humor, you're lost." <laughs> And in this talk, he said the same thing. It's uh, He talked about being in a room, like a, a room meaning the psychological space that we inhabit on the day-to-day, on our day-to-day basis. Uh, and if we take it too seriously, it makes it much more difficult to escape the, the uh, walls of the mind. And... Uh, you know, we need to realize how momentary all of our states are. That there's uh, how there's little reason really to cling and hold on. And the problem is for most of us that attachment to what makes you feel good makes you pretty uh, afraid. And maybe afraid isn't always the right word. He did use that word, but makes you push away at those things which are uncomfortable. So I think that that's uh, an important thing for us to realize uh, um, going through our day-to-day lives. Um, and he talks about avoiding confusion. And that's, that's another uh, something really critical. Um, when you're going through confusion, you know, when we do go through confusion, we cling to something or other, some part of our role, some part of our identity. And and that's in order to stave off that feeling of confusion or negativity or darkness. But it's actually in the confusion that there is the growth. What is that, Leonard Cohn? It's in the cracks that the light can come through, that Leonard Cohn song. Uh, so, yeah, right at, right off the top, there's some, uh, really important things that, uh, uh, can help day to day around, certainly around sense of humor and identity and 
clinging. You know, three critical, critical aspects of the spiritual path. Uh, what else? He talked about, uh, this is interesting, he talked about a nine-year-old that, he, you know, he used to uh, work with uh, dying people. So there's a whole Q&A section to this, by the way, um, around various topics, uh, uh, sexual confusion, diet and food are a couple of them. And he, he talks also about this nine-year-old that he was working with, with the mom who was dying of a brain tumor, and he said it was just it, 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 very, as you can imagine, very, very difficult, uh, because especially when there's a, a, a young person like that, it's 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 impossible to to rationalize and under and have any understanding of how could this happen. And he said this child was just full of light, and um, later on. So the boy died, and his uh, teacher he we had at the time named Joya. Uh, this is rarely talked about by him, by the way, in any lectures because he had a major falling out with her. But in this case, through her, he found that this this boy was actually a very, very, very high being who had come in just for those nine years to do what it, he needed to do in this lifetime to get through whatever karma. And he talks about, you know, that's a, a very tricky thing. It's like uh, he talked about how there are beings that are high beings that go, okay, I have this, that, and the other to get through. And they take very difficult births in order to get through those things. And that's not something that anyone can understand with their mind. I, I can kind of, when he's, as he says it, I can kind of envision the possibility that that could happen, certainly with the guidance of, with the inner guide, with the guru guiding you. Uh, but uh, the human part of us, I think that's almost impossible to to take in uh, in a way that's uh, anywhere near the reality of it. Uh, so that's a, a pretty interesting question right there. I was fascinated by it. Uh, diet and food, I love what he says, you know, you, people go around, you know, eating extremely uh, sattvically, very purely, eating our uh, sprouts, he, <laughs> sprouts must have been big back then, uh, eating our sprouts and really taking care of our bodies. At the same time, we're watching all this garbage on TV, this violence that we are uh, absorbing like sponges and think that that's you know, <laughs> we're doing the right thing because we're eating good. I love that. Um, what else is in here? He talks about dreams. There's some interesting stuff around that. Um, and one thing that really, uh, th this to me was the topper. It's, it's right at the end uh, around the last question somebody's asking. Um, and he gives a whole example about how at one point in his life he 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 had a certain love of uh, hanging out at a classical musical festival and just sitting under the stars and like it just the rush that he got or the the happiness of uh, in, in that moment that he got was so powerful and and he 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 was traveling at one time and going right back through it was in Tanglewood some of you know where that is. On the East Coast, they have this beautiful uh, festival in the summers. And he was traveling back through, and there was a concert there, and he went back to it, and he he tried to recreate the whole thing. And, of course, it just was like it just didn't have the rush that it used to have. And um, so that is, we do go through a, peri a period where we get horrified, where these rushes die. And and you can't conceive that. They, they no longer feed you the way that they used to, and that's called virag in, in Sanskrit, the falling away of stuff. You know, I can't tell you how many people that I talk to, uh, and it's happened to me as well, where suddenly it's, you're just not getting the hit that you used to get off something that really, you, you know, made, made you happy, uh, turned you on. It just isn't there the way it used to be there. And and that can be very disconcerting, as he said, because there's a lag between that stops and then having um, the uh, the 
the other thing which suffuses you with uh, a, a contentment and satisfaction deep in the soul, so to speak. And that lag, uh, is, he calls it the, it's the dark night of the soul, and truly it is. Uh, but that really shows you, um, you know, when you're willing to just go through that uh, period of dissatisfaction and just emptiness, and not the, you know, I'm not talking about the Buddhist uh, shunyata emptiness, which is full, I'm talking about where nothing, you don't give a shit about anything. Uh, and as if you're willing to go through that and allow it to be and let it burn off, and in time, uh, something else replaces it that's much more satisfactory. And that's, that gives you a, a little indication of how, how, how bad you want to get done, get finished. So it's really clinging to rushes. So a uh, lot of stuff here. Great talk. And... Um, you know, happy I, I found this. We get lucky. Uh, well, it's lucky Ramdas <laughs> is so good at what he does that he's able to take uh, concepts that he talks about all the time and just uh, re inhabit them so that they even get more revealing for, for the listener, for the student. So here we are, Ramdas here and now on the Be Here Now Network. Go to be here now network dot com with our host of podcasters, teachers, and thought leaders. And you can hear me, by the way, on Mind Rolling um, on the Be Here Now Network. I talk with lots of different kinds of people about all so I just did a podcast, by the way, with Pico Iyer. If you don't know who he is, listen to this podcast. He's an incredible writer, sort of a spiritual travel writer. Very, He's close to uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He's just one of the most wonderful people I've had. I get such a, it's such an opportunity for me to get to meet all sorts of incredible people and, uh, and spend an hour with them. So, yeah, check, check it out. Mind rolling on Be Here Now Network. And we'll see you on Ramdas Here and Now next time. Namaste. Because there is a need for a certain humor about your own predicament. If you take the room you're in, meaning the psychological room, too seriously, it makes it more difficult to escape. But its walls are made of your thoughts, and a person whose heart is closed a moment later could have their heart open by seeing a little bird fly by. Somebody whose heart is wide open could suddenly have it turn icy cold when they see an expression on somebody else's face. You must realize by now how momentary all of your states are and how little reason there is to cling to them and to hold on. The problem is your attachment to your highs makes you afraid of your lows. Your attachment to your ecstasy makes you horrified by your negative states and your fear and your deadness and your turned offness. When you don't cling to one, you won't have to reject the other. And you will see them all as just passing show, passing states. And here we are. We're each going through. It's like so many television screens. Everyone has a different drama on it, including me. When you're quiet enough, you see everybody's drama going down. If you watch somebody walk by, you can see their whole drama who they think they are and what's happening. Because everybody keeps projecting in a thousand different ways their whole trip. But that trip will be gone in a moment and there'll be another trip. Some of you have been very good at holding on to your trips for years, the same trip. And you've gotten to think it's real. You know, some people can spend 40 years dying. <laughs> we all are or 40 years finding what I'll do when I grow up. Hmm. I decided I'd never grow up, so it was irrelevant. Each, each day I start all over again. If you would just allow for the... In order to avoid confusion, you often cling to one of the rooms 
one of the emotional psychological states of identity, just in order to avoid confusion. But actually, it's in the confusion that there is growth. If I could keep you more and more confused, if I was... See, the, my predicament, this is very far out, my predicament is I'm too merciful. I really are. I'm a really soft schnook. That's why I'm a lousy teacher. If I were more caring, I would be much more Kali-like. I would be keeping you up all night. I would be changing my emotional moods. I'd be doing a real Gurdjieff trip with incredible love and fierceness and unpredictability. Shruti's good at that. He plays that one out much better than I do. Right? It's a dance. It's a dance of cutting through your expectations and leaving you confused and disoriented. And in that confusion is growth. Right. Now, by pulling out some of your pins, and it's just got to be done gently, and in a period of four days, you can only go so far. When I do a two-week process, I just keep adding steam as time goes on. There's a, a first gung-ho spirit for about three days, and then there's a depression and a sloppiness, and then comes the next one, which is because it's deeper and heavier and deader, and and then there's that cycle, and you just go through cycles in this whole process, and then everybody decides nothing's happening and it's all a crock of shit, and that's another state, and then comes the one after that, and we just keep going through them one after another together. How many of you have cheated on the speaking? Tell the truth. See? You're not alone. Uh, don't have guilt, but don't do it anymore now for a day. Because you can get very sloppy at this point, and you're just watering down your own experience. So tighten up your ship once more. Because otherwise you're watering down this next 24 hours. We'll release it after tomorrow night. But if you're smart, you'll tighten it up between now and then. Okay? That's up to you. I'm just telling you how I would do it if I were trying to use this situation. I'd be using every moment. Every second of it. Because the Shakti that is released in a scene where so many people gather who are genuinely seeking is an incredible force to work with for your own growth. It's like one of the holy places, the Siddhapits, the, the special places like uh, special mountains in uh, New Mexico or uh, Stonehenge or places like this that have certain powers. And the power is created by our gathering in this purity. This is what churches are about. The house of God is where people come bringing the power of their spiritual concern. Why churches lost it was because everybody came to get it and nobody brought it or generated it. Everybody just went and took some and left and then there was nothing left. But we have taken and we're reinvesting as every, I'm sure, retreat does in this building. It invests in it, its, its own spiritual power. So whatever room you're in, don't get too comfortable in it. Let your meditation or your breath loosen it's the hold of that model you have of what this experience is about. If you've already defined what this was experience was about, if you've already got your editorial comment for when you leave, you're blowing it, I'll tell you, <laughs> okay? Time enough as you ride down the road, you can decide what it was. Don't know too soon. And I will try to be more unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. What's the relationship between conscious act of consuming your desires or your states of consciousness with that?
There are many acts which we tend to interpret psychologically in terms of nervous habits or neurotic behavior, sexual pathology, um, various kinds of aberrant habits that turn out to have a source that is much deeper than a psychological source. There is a lot of, as I dig deeper into the spiritual community and work with individuals more and more, I'm amazed at how much um, for example, sexual confusion there exists in the history of the people that end up in the spiritual game. And at first I decide, well, they're all just a bunch of neurotics. You know, I think I'll go into another business where I deal with healthy people. But from having been a therapist for a number of years, I'm aware that that isn't so different from the general population. It's just that sometimes it comes to the surface more in this population. And that a lot of things that we treated as pathology in ourselves and treated as neurotic behaviors often have uh, a much deeper spiritual genesis in them. Now that isn't to conclude that you're biting your nails isn't a nervous habit. It's serving functionally, psychologically, to relieve your anxiety or as a manifestation of your tension. But the whole business of eating or consuming or sucking or drinking or receiving or penetrating or all of these things have connected with them some uh, part of the spiritual process of the lingam and the yoni and the coming, the merging, the merging process. And uh, the uh, very often when you're making love to somebody, you would like you never can penetrate them deeply enough or devour them enough with your mouth, and you want to consume them. You want to really almost rip them and pull them into yourself or merge with them or receive them so fully into yourself or whatever the process is that you're involved with. And uh, that has that deeper space connected to it. And the thing is that it's like uh, Ramana Maharshi saying, what is it if two bodies rub against each other? Because it'll never be the thing that you're trying to get except at the moment of orgasm and ultimately when you live in that moment of orgasm, then it becomes less relevant. But until then, it's serving that function of trying to consume the universe back into itself. Uh, I don't think it pays to get too analytic about any particular set of symptoms. I think that, the, that you can spend an awful lot of time dealing with your neurosis out of proportion to their worth. It's the same thing as I used to spend lots of time combing my hair over my bald spot, right? I mean, a lot of time and in the mirror and seeing if I could make it and discussing whether I'd have a toupee or have a hair implant or all that stuff. That was like 10 years ago. And now it all seems quite irrelevant to me, really quite irrelevant, you know? I mean, my beauty pours forth bald or her suit, you know? I could have a toupee or not now. I actually have one, so I can go into meetings without being noticed, which is kind of fun. A big, uh, wild one, you know. <laughs> My Sai Baba affectation. <laughs> and with shades, you'd never know. It's far out. I, even I don't recognize me. Uh, but it's irrelevant. And um, I find that an awful lot of things that people come to me that they're preoccupied with uh, is a way in which their ego is keeping them from transcending it. That there is power in neurosis. There's power in keeping you neurotic. It keeps the, because the ego, it's very funny how the ego is built on um, how to say it? Well, in Christianity, it's called original sin, but it would be inadequacy or unworthiness in psychodynamic terms. 
And if you go to the root of most people's ego, you'll find feelings of not being enough. And that's what they, the ego is saying, if you don't keep my superstructure, you're going to realize how horrible you are or how objectionable you are, either id or just negativity. And the ego is really conning you. It's really conning you, as Jung pointed out to Freud. Because there are other levels behind all that stuff, which is what we're talking about now. And my game is to do a holding action on the neurosis and get preoccupied with the deeper levels of oneself until one gets enough leverage on, in there, that space to come back and decathect or clean out the neurosis. But don't go through the neurosis because you never get through it. You just keep, if you keep wondering why you're biting your nails, you'll do it for the next 40 years. And you can have analytic treatments about nail biting and go to nail biting specialists and be, you know, have your nails massaged and you'll still end up a neurotic, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, try pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I mean, after a while, there's no more to bite, and then you'll get on with it. I, it's it's not worth. Um, it's really not worth, the obstacles can become the preoccupation. So every time it's like the breath, you start to follow your breath and then you notice you're biting your nails. So just put your hand down and go back to following your breath. It's just the ego saying, think of me, think of me, think of me, come on. You're too neurotic to get the guys, you're, too, you're not good, you can't make it, you know. You screwed up, you better work on me first, you know. And it'll keep you sucked in for the rest of your life, really it will. Uh, from your point of view, it comes back to what we said yesterday, which is true in all relationships, that to the extent that you are free of the attachment to how it ought to be with him and to your identity as a father, still being able to be a father perfectly, I'm not talking about abrogating your responsibility, but not being lost in fatherness, you can see him as a being who is living out a certain incarnation in which this neurotic pattern is showing. By contacting that being behind the neurotic pattern, he can drop it when he's ready to drop it. That is, my understanding of the way in which a child grows is you create the garden in which the flower grows. You don't grow the flower. You can't grow it. You can merely fertilize the earth and keep it soft and moist, and then the flower grows. And you create a space with your consciousness that determines whether that neurotic pattern gets deeper into that child or whether it's seen as something like the sweater which can be cast off because that isn't who he is. If you define this being as my child who has this habit, and that's the major reality of the relationship between you and the child, that's catching him in the habit. The minute you see him as a soul who's incarnated in this situation in which he's working through this stuff, he's free to drop it whenever he needs it because you're not attached to his having it or not having it. Right? Can you hear that? It's an interesting one. Because people get guilty that they're not doing enough about their children and they tend to do this thing, you know. <laughs> well, you're, you can't, you don't change your wife or your child, you keep working on yourself until you are such a clear mirror reflection supportive rock of love for all those beings that everybody's free to give up their stuff when they want to give it up. Your wife, her anxiety, your child, that habit. Okay? You keep creating a space in which people can grow when they're ready to grow. The predicament is that a child and a parent may be at very different levels of evolution in terms of their age of being. A child could be much older than the parent or much younger than the parent in an evolutionary sense. 
There are many old beings being born into this kind of a culture at this moment. They have been looking to take birth in a conscious environment, and this is very good for yogis to do this. So that some of you have babies that don't want to be incarnated particularly, because they're almost beyond it. They're just doing some little cleanup operation. I had a very interesting experience about this. Um, this is a hard one, too. I work with um, dying people, and um, I was, I've talked about this in lectures, I think. I was working with this young boy. Well, I was actually working with his mother. He was nine years old, and he was dying of a brain tumor. And uh, she and I were working on her consciousness and how to prepare him and the whole business. And uh, he died. And then about two weeks later, and I got very involved in it. I got very attached to the boy. He's a beautiful boy, light pouring out of him. And I was almost angry at God. Almost. I mean, I had a deep enough understanding to not get carried away, but there was such beauty there that I kept trying to hold it on earth. And about two weeks later, Joya said to me, um, we were talking about saints and holy men and gurus and all, and she said, uh, we were talking about, did you know so-and-so, and there was this saint who did this, and then she said, didn't you know a um, saint that came to earth and stayed about uh, nine years and left, came to bless people? I said, no, I didn't know anybody like that. She closed her eyes, she went into an astral plane, she came in, she said, oh, I know you know that person. And she's at that level, she's not oriented in time, so she doesn't know whether it's this life or that life or here or there or anything. She just knows that I knew this being, there was a connection. Oh, you know. I said, no, I don't know anybody, really, Joy. I mean, I've thought about, you know, who was young and died young as a saint that I'd ever read about and stuff like that. I then she the, she kept saying nine years old nine years old nine and finally I said well listen the only nine thing the only thing that associates the nine years old is a young boy died in the Peter Ben Brigham Hospital a couple of weeks ago from a brain tumor oh that's the one yeah, that's the one now what happened was the same thing that happened to me when Maharaji said to me your mother's a great saint it flipped my perception around of that whole situation of what that being was doing on earth, what their work was. The minute you do a take of beings as souls rather than personalities and bodies, you don't cling to the incarnation that hard. You understand its function and you can let it go or hold on. Right? And you don't demand that the incarnation be other than it is. I mean, I can uh, imagine a conscious, I've used this as an example in lectures, a conscious being who is choosing his next incarnation or her next incarnation. And I've, I've said, imagined it in a lecture, because this is the way it works, actually, with the karma council, I mean, on the astral uh, melodrama levels. Somebody's saying, um, well, I think I'll take a birth in a, the poorest tribe in Africa. Let's see, I think I'll be, my parents were syphilitic, so I'll be uh, deformed. And then I think I should be raped at 11. That would be good. I'd clean up that karma. Let's see. Because you've got a grid. You see what you need to clean up, you know. And then, uh, why don't I die at 17? A horrible death. That would be good. That would really cool it. And in 17 years, I can clean up that one, that one, that one. Oh, geez, that's great. I'll just get it all done in one birth. Okay. And you look around, you find the parents who need you like you need them. Because it's all, everybody's getting their karma up in that sense. It's a karma grid. Here I go, and there you are, wah, wah, and you're a little child born with this terrible deformity. And everybody's saying, the poor baby. And it is a poor baby on that level. On the other level, it isn't a poor baby at all. And it's very tricky which level of consciousness you climb into. And the power of a conscious being is they don't use one against the other. They keep all those levels of consciousness going simultaneously. So that somebody is brought in to see me in a stretcher and they're in terrible pain and they have been in years. And at one level I can see they're doing a tremendous amount of work this life. And another, God, this person's suffering so badly, can I do anything to relieve the suffering? 
both of those at the same moment, consciousness. And if that person that's brought to me is somebody who says, I wish to awaken during this lifetime, Ram does help me, I say to them, well, you're really feeling sorry for yourself. You really got a good birth, you're cleaning up a lot of stuff. Let's work on how to convert pain. And if they are somebody who didn't say that, but just happens to meet like somebody's aunt or something like that that I meet, I say, God, it's really rough how much you're suffering. Here, let me fix the pillow for you, or are you having proper medical treatment, or what can I do for you? It's very interesting how you deal with pain and suffering, depending on which plane of consciousness is the dominant theme, although you never forget the other one. But a strong consciousness keeps it all going all at once. You do everything you can to help your son feel more loved, calm, sensitive, supportive, and everything, and get rid of the neurotic habits, at the same moment you are not attached and you understand that is the karma of this being being lived out and you work on yourself until you are a perfect environment for that being to do what it needs to do. Okay. Questions? Diet and food and getting obsessed with it. We tend to get a little more preoccupied with diet than is proportional, than is reasonable in relation to how little obsessed we are with the garbage we feed into our minds. You think nothing of looking at violence for four hours on television, at the same time being careful to eat sprouts. <laughs> there is such a bizarre humor in that. That's like a grotesque Charles Adams cartoon in some sense. <laughs> uh, it is, there are balances in this whole dance. And uh, just as balances of heart and mind and so on, you can get to be a good meditator, but no flow. So you've got to work with a balance. At different stages of your sadhana, different diets are indicated, and also different kinds of sadhana require different diets. If you're doing a lot of meditating, you will want to have a reasonably light diet. So you'll be able to stay alert for meditating. If you are doing a lot of pranayama, you want to have a reasonably bland diet because your stomach will be upset most of the time when you're doing pranayama. If you are doing a karma yoga diet, you may want a diet that has a lot of heat in it, a lot of energy foods in it, a lot of high, very high protein diet. At different stages of your sadhana, even with any one of these, your diet will keep changing also. There are times when you could do very well with grains, vegetables, and fruits. There are times when you could do very well with just fruits. There are other times when you need fish and eggs to supplement your diet. I think that you shouldn't get into a good and evil issue about diet at all. It's not a moral issue from the way I'm looking at it as a yogi. It's a functional issue in terms of what you need to create the environment, since your body is your environment and you are in some sense what you eat physiologically, creating an environment in which you can do the work you need to do. You will come to a point where you're entering, if your path is through the samadhi states, where you're entering samadhi, where it'll be hard to get even a mouthful of food down. And then there'll come a time when you just eat like a wild man or woman. And it's best not to have a model of what is holy because it's going to have to be knocked apart anyway. Um, it is in general, I think, useful to fast once a week. It is general for most of us to keep our diets reasonably light, but be careful about anemia and keep your protein up, either with protein supplements or with protein foods. In general, heavy spiced foods and meat products and lots of spices tend to make it more difficult to not get lost in worldly stuff. It's just a general rule of the game. No big deal about it, but just a general rule of thumb. Listen to your own heart about what you need. Don't let anybody else create guilt in you. All right? That isn't the issue. It, 
When something comes up, do you hang out with it, give it space, or do you give it up? If something comes up that is key, that is a veil that keeps you from clarifying, were you able to give it up, you would give it up. If you are not able to give it up, you give it space. You acknowledge it and play with it. Work with it. Acknowledge it. Allow it. Allow it. Give it space. Honor it. It's called honoring it. You honor it. I honor your existence. I don't have to either love it or hate it. I just honor it. Right? I give it space to be. And by giving it space to be, it starts to lose. If I try to push it too hard or pull it too hard, a lot of people were trying to get high or trying to get rid of their body conditions because I was saying, come on up, let go of your body. And they were trying to do it, and the trying stops it. So you, make, you aim in that direction, and then you give space to what is, is the root. You aim to give it up, but if it doesn't go away, you give it space. Keep nudging it, you know, just nudge it, but don't get too dramatic because the drama just keeps invest, investing it with solidity and reality, whatever thing it is that's bothering you. Can you hear that? Questions? Yeah. How do you see dreams? Is there a use for them? Uh, in general, I'm inclined to suggest you don't do too much analytic work in this dance, because your mind plays too many tricks. If the dream has an immediate significance, that affects you emotionally, work with it. It may give you a click into place of something you needed to understand about yourself, fine. But if you say, I wonder what that meant, forget it, okay? It's got, it fits under the category of things, when you're ready to know, you'll know. If you're not ready to know, forget it. Don't sit and analyze or wonder or get preoccupied with it, okay? It all has meaning. It's all work you're doing on other planes, right? It is significant spiritually, but you don't have to understand it. You are existing at many planes simultaneously at this moment. The only reason you don't know of your other identities is because you're so attached to this one, right? It's like I'll get letters all the time saying, thank you for coming to me at two in the morning and helping me when I was in a state of terrible need. You appeared in my room and you touched my head and I felt blessed. And, he has a million dollars, you know, something like that. That's a hypothetical letter. <laughs> That's never happened. Um, and I'll think back, and what I was doing was watching television, or uh, eating a peanut butter sandwich, or sleeping, or something like that. And I think, well, they're Meshuggana. I really wasn't there. It's only their hysteria that brought me. But later, I realized that that wasn't true, because what would happen is, in my meditations, I would suddenly feel pulls from beings. And I would feel, excuse me, I would feel pulled to one place or another. And I began to realize that in fact I was going there, but not in my physical body. And I was attached to my physical body, so I wasn't recognizing that that work was going on. Now I acknowledge that all that's going on too, and more and more in my meditations, I go through planes in which I am experiencing very far out stuff, not only being pulled by thought forms of beings on this plane, but working, in fact, it turns out that most of the work I do is not on this plane at all. This is very far out, that most of the work I do is with beings on other planes, not with this plane. And I'm just beginning to appreciate that, that, those feelings on those planes of consciousness where that's going on. And then that's all more stuff, of course, just more stuff. And if you're going for broke, you just go through it like this, you know. I mean, let it do its thing. Sure, fine. I'm going for God. I'm going all the way. What I'm suggesting, I'm just telling you how it'll be, the stuff keeps falling away. It just keeps turning into nothingness. Like, um, 
Oh, when I was at uh, Harvard, one of the big deals I used to do was go up to Tanglewood, which is a music festival, a summer music festival, and they have huge oaks, and I'd get wine and cheese, and I'd lay under the oaks, and I'd listen to uh, Berlioz Requiem, and it would be a moonlit night, and I would be in ecstasy. I mean, this was young Werther, uh, you know, it was the total poetic image of myself uh, in, this, in these ecstatic states with a very romantic music and all. Uh, about two years ago, I was giving a lecture somewhere, and I was on my way up to Vermont to give another lecture, and I went through Lennox with Tanglewood, and it turned out there was a concert that night, and they were playing barely on. I couldn't miss that. I just had to do it again. And I went out, and I got the wine and the cheese and the whole shtick and the blanket, and I got there early and lay under the oak, and it was a moonlit night, and they played barely on. And it was my old college roommate arrived, by the way, with his three children, and that was funny. Uh, and it turned out that it was totally empty. It was delightful emptiness. I mean, I was, I couldn't recreate the space of involvement anymore, and yet it was delightful, but it was empty. It could be there or it could not be there. And in a way, you will go through a period, some of you have already done it, where you are horrified by your dying the dying of rushes you were previously getting from life. That you try to hold on to something that was giving you a rush before because you couldn't ever conceive that that thing wouldn't always give you a rush, but it doesn't. And the lag between when you stopped having the rush and when you're willing to cop to it, see, that's how bad you want to get done. Because a lot of us are clinging to rushes we're already done having. Partly because we don't know what to do next, or partly because we're afraid of what happens next. Because lest ye die, ye cannot be born again. And this is death of the experiencer to become the experience. And all these experiences you've been collecting, having, enjoying, participating in, they are all there, and they're all empty. Now, empty is in a negative sense. Ultimately, at first it is because you're not getting the rush. And that's the dark night of the soul in St. John of the Cross, where you've lost the fun of the world and you haven't yet fully tasted the divinity. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.